I was muted. Hello, Antonio, Pika, Shrek, and Nookus. Hello, D Stratus. Hello, Mike. Yeah, happy last week of classes to everybody. Hello, Belkit. Hello, Amin. Hello, Donk Bear. Donk. Donk attack. Hey, Dr. E, do you think you could give any insight on how the graphs for number four should look? Kind of unsure of my results. Um, let me think about it. Let me think about it. I mean, they, it's something that kind of swoops and like comes back. Mike says, gonna miss the donk memes. I know. What's up, Brandon? Yeah, e email me. Email me, Cowardly Bean. I mean, says, for the homework, when I set settling time equal to 10, my, res my response settles around 12. So in MATLAB, I chose settling time to be seven seconds. Would that be okay? That is okay with me. I mean, that is okay. Now, that being said, like, I also don't expect all of you to adjust. It's okay if you calculate your closed loop poles just based on the specifications that I give you. And if it doesn't look like it's exactly giving you what you should get, you, you can leave it. Um, because I've explained a couple times that for this homework, the initial conditions make it so that the response doesn't look like a typical step response and the settling time doesn't really fall. It, it, it doesn't settle in the same way, so it's hard to verify those things. Um, but if you want to play around with those parameters, that's totally okay. Um, for some reason, with the estimator, my graph is unstable, says Mike. But without the estimator, it's fine. Interesting. I do have office hours today. So if you're if you're still working on the homework and you're having some issues, if something's unstable, come to office hours. We can talk about it. Um, Ashish. Hey, I'm doing well. Welcome back. Uh, Antonio I was just, says, I was just going to ask how we figure out the settling time since the initial velocity is in zero. So that's that's the thing. Settling time is defined with respect to the system starting at rest. Because I gave initial conditions where the velocity is non-zero, I, I actually kind of did that unintentionally. Um, But because the velocity is not zero, the, the usual definition of settling time doesn't even apply. So I think I've sent an email or two about this that, um, don't worry about that. Like, I recognize that it's not the typical settling time scenario, so it's, it's just not going to look the same way. Um, hello, that guy who stays. Why says, do we have all the knowledge we need to do the project whenever it gets posted? So you don't have all of it yet. I have posted the project today and the content that we're going to go through today in class is going to help you get started. And I'm going to try to point out as we go, like, Hey, this is going to help you with the first part of the project. This is going to help you with the second part. And, um, so definitely, of course, this week you'll have everything you need by the end. So, um, when will the project be due? It's gonna be due next Friday. So you have two weeks. And this project isn't as long 
as the first project. Um, so I think two weeks is gonna be is gonna be fine. Um, D Stratus, are you going to have office hours next week if we have questions about the project? Yes. Yes, you're gonna be able to talk to me next week if you have questions on the project. Antonio says, should we just skip that part of homework five? No, I wouldn't skip it, but I would just, um, I would discuss the types of things that I've been discussing, like settling time. When we derived that quantity, it was with respect to a second order system starting at rest, given a unit step reference, or I guess it doesn't matter if it's a unit step reference or some other amplitude. This system, the initial conditions aren't consistent with that definition because it has some initial velocity. So we shouldn't expect it to behave in that same way. Um, hey, easy eight. Hope you've been having a good week. Thank you. By the way, did you see my email? Maybe, but I don't know who you are in real life. <laughs> I've answered I answered a bunch of emails yesterday and, and this morning, but I, I'm not sure if it was yours. Uh, Amin says, can you possibly shift the grad project deadline to May 16th or 17th, since we also have the second project due on the 14th? I'll think about it. Um, okay, Ashish has a related question. I'll think about it. All right, let's get started. Okay, so the first thing, the very first thing, let's, let me show you project two. Let me show you project two. And then as we go, at no, 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 says, I would like to second a means proposal. I hear you. Okay, let me just show it to you really quick. This looks very similar to project one, where we have the same system. It's that six volt mo motor. Not a grad student, but I'll third it. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so the sampling frequency the same, the definition of the input and the output is the same. So like, look at this. The first thing, put this in controllable canonical state space form. That's gonna be easy peasy. Part two, determine in X, in U. We're gonna talk about this today. We started talking about it a little bit last time. So you can do that. Um, part three, we're going to touch on today. But the, the gist of this project is you're gonna do the same, you're gonna control the same system from project one with very similar specification, but you're gonna do it with state feedback instead of using the root locus. So I, I like it because it gives you, um, experience with the same system, but using different techniques. Okay, so I'll keep coming back to this document this week and tell you like, hey, we're covering stuff that's relevant to this part of the project or that part of the project. Okay. So, 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 so. Let's get started. Oh, this is not plugged in. Let's turn this music down. There's no handout for today. Well, actually, we're going to go back. Like, for the handout from last time, we didn't finish. So I'm going to go back to that handout in a second. So if you have that nearby, get it ready. Okay, so we are... This is stuff related to Project 2. So tracking a reference signal... using state feedback. It's a little different with state feedback 
So far, we've been covering the regulator problem. The regulator problem is where the reference signal is zero. So what do you do when it's not zero? Okay. Okay, so we're gonna have to redefine our control input to track the reference signal just say define the control input as this uk equals minus k times your states minus your reference states. Actually, I'm gonna write this just a little differently. Instead of a subscript K, I'll just put a parentheses. Just a different way of writing the same thing. And I think if you look at the handout from last time, I might have defined the sign of this differently. I think I reversed the sign, but this definition that I'm giving you right now is what I prefer to use, even though you can use the other one. Um, so, so this is what we're gonna use. And so this is our feedback gain matrix, which we're familiar with this and how to solve for it, given your target closed loop poles. So these are your states. And you know, in practice, we're gonna use the estimated states because we don't know the true states. But for now, I'm just putting the states themselves. These are what we call our reference states. And we're gonna start today by talking more about these. So here's the definition for the reference states, the mathematical definition. It's gonna be this matrix NX times your reference signal. So this matrix, we call it the state command matrix. And all you should think of it as is the conversion between the reference signal and what the reference states are. So when we do state feedback, um, we're trying to minimize the error between the states and the reference states. And the reference states are related to the reference signal that we're trying to follow. Okay. And then we covered this last time. So how do you figure out what that conversion factor is? To solve for NX, use this equation. So if you're wondering where this, where this comes from, what's the reasoning, check out what we did in the last class. It'll go through all the details. So we have to take the inverse of this matrix and multiply it by one and then a zero vector here. Maybe I'll fill in some sizes here. Um, you know, like if we have Let's say we have um, in states. So if we have like a second order system, in would be equal to two. So like A would be two by two, it's always square. It's the size of your states. So this identity matrix would have to be two by two. Um, we're just looking at one input for now. Um, so B would be two by one. 
Really, I should be using the little N. And this, this zero vector here, it's just a vector filled with zeros. This is gonna be N by one. Um, this N U, what is this? This comes from the definition of the steady state control input. So if we just have one input at steady state, so as K goes to infinity, it's going to be related to the reference signal by this in U parameter. So the reference states are related to the reference signal by in X. And you can also figure out what the steady state output is by this relationship. Liam says, so when you find NX and NU for the project, we will use A and B, not A augmented and B augmented, right? Yes. I'll come back to that. The answer should be yes. Antonio says, working on my 552 project today and thought you'd like it. It's optimizing an open loop controller for a drone that can transform from hover to forward flight with wings. That sounds very interesting. C, okay, Pika says C is one by N. Yes, in this case, um, let's let's assume that there's one output as well. So yes, so this zero is just one by one. So this is this equation right here is assuming any number of states in, but we're having one input and one output. So that's also consistent with your project, project number two, one input, one output. We'll just stick with that for now. If we're not told how many inputs and outputs, can we always assume CISO? You will always know the number of inputs and outputs. I don't think there's any reason you, you wouldn't know how many inputs and outputs you have for a controls problem. Okay, I wanna go back to our handout from last time because I wanna do an example where we solve for NX and NU. So we, we were working on this last time and we got to this example, but, but we didn't get to, um, we didn't get into it yet. So, okay, think about this. Let's say we're trying to, like we have this spring mass system and we're trying to control the position of the mass. So the position of the mass is measured like that's our output. We're measuring that position. So that's why. Um, and let's say we have a reference position that we want, R, the reference position for the mass. Um, so let's, let's assume that the mass starts here, but we wanna move it, maybe we wanna move it over here and let's say that's that position is R. So we wanna scoot that mass over a little bit. And in this problem, specifically we'll say R is half a meter. Okay, so here's some specifications. Let's say the mass is one, one kilogram. This is the stiffness of the spring, 100 newtons of force per meter of deflection. We have some damping. And this is a digital system, so let's say we get a measurement of the position every, almost every hundredth of a second. Okay, so below, I show you two different state space models for the same system. Let's start with the one on the left. This is in physical coordinates. So that means the states are based on physical quantities. So our first state is based on y, 
and y is just the position of the mass. Our second state is the first time derivative of y, so this is the velocity of the mass. So these are very typical states to pick for a mechanical system. On homework five, Casper says, do we want our output to satisfy the performance constraint explicitly or do we want something within those constraints? Um, explicitly. Okay, the output equation in terms of these state definitions, if my output is just the position and I defined the first state to be the position, then this should be our C matrix. It's one times the position plus zero times the input force. So in this problem, the control input is a, a force on the mass. Okay, if you go through modeling it and then you convert it to discrete time state space form. So I'm, I'm skipping steps here and just showing you the final result. This would be the A and the B matrix. This would be the C matrix. And, and really this zero is the D matrix. So the question is, what are the reference states for this? So just to build this up again, let's say R, I wanna move the mass to a position 0 0.5 meters and when I define my control input at each step, it's going to be minus some gain matrix times, and I'm just going to put the actual states here, even though we'll use the estimated states, minus some reference states. So the question is, like, what, what should these reference states be if the reference position is 0.5 meters. On homework five, the canonical state space is already in discrete time. We don't have to convert, right? That's right, because I give you a transfer function that's in the discrete domain. If you see a transfer function with Z's in it, that already means it's in discrete time. So when you convert that discrete time transfer function into a state space model, it's already in discrete time. Okay. Now, in this case, you don't really have to use that matrix equation that, uh, that I was showing you earlier. I mean, you could to solve for NX and NU and that's related to the reference um, because I know that the first state is defined as position and the second is defined as velocity that when I have XR, I'll have like reference position and reference velocity And so because one of my states is already position and the reference signal is in terms of position, I just know right away that I want my states to look like this. Um, I wanna move the block to a position 0.5 and assuming we want it to be sitting at rest right there, then I want the reference velocity to be zero there. Um, so, so this is an example when you know physically what your states are very well and you know the, re the relationship between the states and the reference signal, then it's very easy to, to define what like the reference states should be. Um, let's come over here to the right hand side though. Another state space representation is modal coordinates. 
And in this case, state one, I have it equal to, actually this is the Greek letter nu. But what these represent are modal amplitudes. And, and don't worry too much about what that means. Just this is a definition of the states that isn't some physical quantity like position or velocity. And when you follow through the modeling on this, you have a C matrix that looks a lot different. The A matrix is different. The B matrix is different. Well, the D matrix is still zero. And a lot of times in practice, your state space model might not be in physical coordinates, especially if you use a system identification algorithm. A lot of those algorithms spit out a state space model that's in some really random coordinate system. So then in this case, you're like, okay, I want to move the mass to a reference position of five meters, but what are my reference states? Because they're, they're definitely not equal to 0 0.5 and 0 like last time because that was using physical coordinates and we're not, we're not in the same coordinate system anymore. Okay, so what, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have to use this development where XR is some factor in X that I don't I don't know what it is yet and um, uh, let's leave that for now so what we're gonna use and when, when you solve for in X it depends on this in you as well so so that's why I bring it in here Maybe we don't always really care what in you is, but it's. So we need the inverse of this. And then this vector is one and then zero, two by one. So what I want to do, I want to start a MATLAB code for this system. And uh, so we'll, we'll solve for NX and in you and MATLAB. And then we'll keep working with this system a little bit to show you how you would actually design this controller. Okay. So I'm gonna go over to MATLAB. I'm gonna go over to MATLAB. Okay, so this is like a Spring mass position control using state feedback. So I'm just going to define a bunch of stuff. This was our sampling period. I don't know why I defined it as this kind of random number. I probably had a good reason at the time. But I can't remember what that was. And then, so I'm going to use... I'm gonna use that second state space model that was in the modal coordinate system. So I'm just rewriting that matrix. Let's get B. One, two, seven. Zero point zero three zero six. Okay, so we have our A, B, C, D, and now I want to solve for N, X, N, U, and so we got to do this matrix equation right here. So let's we'll take the C matrix on the top row, and it has a zero next to it. And then if we go to the next row, it's the A matrix minus the identity matrix. And then you have B. We have to take the inverse of this. And one way to do it is you have this backslash and whatever it's leaning on 
it'll take the inverse of that. So it's like leaning on this matrix, so we're gonna take the inverse of this matrix. And then we're gonna multiply that by a vector that looks like this, one on top of two zeros. And I'll call this result like the in matrix because it contains in X and in U. And so I'm calling like, in my code, I'm calling this the in matrix. And this, this is gonna be two by one. This is gonna be one by one. You can kind of tell from over here, like what the dimensions would be because the reference signal is one by one. My, my reference states are there. Those are going to be the same dimension as my state. So I have two states. So to make the dimensions all consistent here, this would have to be two by one. You take a two by one by a one by one, you get a two by one. So when I go to MATLAB, I can say that in X, is the first two rows of the in matrix. And I could say in U is just the last element. And then to get my reference states, XR would be in X times my reference which we didn't, we didn't define that yet in here. Let's put it in. Let's say for now it's just, I wanna move that mass to 0 0.5 meters. And while we're here, because we have in U, let's get the steady state value of what the control input needs to be. So this will tell us how much force, mind of vacuum says, ooh, MATLAB. I'm sorry. Okay, let's run this. In X is this, in U is this. So what are our reference states? X, R. And what is our steady state force? 49.98, almost 50. U steady state, let's, let me go back here. So, actually I'll go back to this from yesterday, but the steady state or USS, the steady state value of the control input why is in you, wouldn't that be outside the two by one range? Well, no, no, because I'm saying, so I calculated this matrix product, right? Um, this overall is going to evaluate to a three by one vector. And I'm saying that the first two entries are gonna be in X and the final entry is gonna be in U. Anyone else getting an error when trying to make the in matrix? Make sure all A, B, C, Ds are the right size too. Like C is a one by two, B is a two by one. Like this has a comma, but this has a semicolon. Maybe little things like that. This is a semicolon here. Okay, let's go, let's go back here really quick. Let's fill in the results. So when you, when you solve this, I got in X 
But why does NX have two values? Yeah, I already explained that. And in the interest of time, I won't explain it again. All right, let's. Here we go. Or let's do it this way. The reference states are in X times R. Yeah, Pika, that's that's a perfect answer. Okay, so NX was 31.276 minus 5.177. And then our reference signal is 0.5. So if you multiply this out, our reference states are 15.638 and minus 2.588. Now this part, so the steady state value of the control input, which in this case, it's the force that we're applying to the block to move it. What was in you? In you was 99.96 and R was 0 0.5. And this, you know, this basically evaluates to 50 Newtons. Now this is cool. Um, why is it like this precise number? If you go back up here, just for this problem, I defined the spring to be 100 Newtons per meter in, in stiffness. So if I move it half a meter, you know, you have Hooke's law, the force is the spring constant times how much you stretch the spring. So 100 Newtons per meter times 0 0.5 meters, that means it's 50 Newtons. 50 Newtons of force that you need in the end. So that, that comes back to making some physical sense as well. Okay. So, let's go here really quick. Let's go back to this other sheet that I started at the beginning of today. Okay, so you can solve for NX and NU, right? So let's assume that you have your reference states and really they, they don't have to be a constant. Like if your reference is changing with each time step, you would just multiply that reference by in X at each time step and update your reference states. So part of project two is you're going to track um, a ramp reference again, like we did for project one. So the reference is just going to be increasing with time. And so you'll put this like linearly increasing function in here, whatever. You just multiply it by that each time. Okay. So, okay, you have your reference states. So then we say our control input once again is minus your feedback gain matrix times your states minus your reference states. Um, so I want to, I want to run this controller and, and show something to you. This will usually result in some steady state error.
so maybe I'll put this here kind of like a proportional controller. Like early on in this class, we, we introduced a proportional controller where your control input is some gain times your output error, which this kind of looks like that too. It's a gain times like a state error. Those control, a proportional controller generally has steady state error. So we're gonna have to correct that. Well, and think, so as we simulate this, and we're gonna get some steady state error, think in the back of your mind, like how did we correct steady state error when we were using the root locus method? Okay, so we'll come back over here. Okay, so up to this point, having this code these, these techniques, this will get you through like the first two deliverables of project two. Easy peasy, okay? So let's, um, let's run a controller. Um, and what I wanna do The first step that you always take is you pick some target closed loop poles. And I, I have two of these on hand that we're just gonna use. So these poles give a settling time of around one second for this sampling period. And I think it has an overshoot of 10%. So it's just a pair of complex conjugate poles. So let's say, maybe we'll put this here. Settling time of one second, overshoot of 10%. So the next step is to solve for your feedback gain matrix. Row vector, not a column. Oh my gosh. You could do a row vector, but I like column vectors better. Okay, so you can use the Ackerman formula, which is the Ocker command in MATLAB. So you just put your A matrix, your B matrix, which we already defined up here. And then you put your target closed loop poles. We're the column vector game. It's okay if you like your row vectors. And then I, I always like to check um, if this feedback gain matrix is doing its job then if you take the eigenvalues of this matrix, they should be equal to Z star. So how about we run this and we should see, th should see these numbers pop up for the eigenvalues. So we see those same eigenvalues. So this K matrix, good, muy bueno. Okay, so let's run this controller. And when I, when I run this controller, um, I'm not gonna implement an estimator right now, just to save some time. I'm gonna assume that we know the true states. And, and even with that, you're gonna see that we're gonna get some steady state error. We will add in an estimator, but for now, um, okay, so let's, let's choose the time we're gonna simulate. We're gonna start at time zero. We're gonna go in increments of our sampling period and because this system should settle in about one second, I'm just gonna go a little bit past the settling time. So I'll go to 1.5 seconds. Boom, and I made it a column. So that's our time. So the number of samples in our simulation, I just like to do this. It's gonna be the length. So this just gives you the number of samples or elements in this vector. So that means that X, we have two states, 
And when we simulate it, we're gonna uh, generate a column vector two by one for all n steps. And so I just stack those columns side by side to like store them. We're gonna measure our output position. We're gonna have a control input. So I, I'm just initializing these variables and then we'll fill in these as we go. I'm gonna have a reference signal. So we just wanna move the mass to a reference position of 0.5. So this reference is just gonna be 0.5 all the time. Okay. And then just like this, I can define what my reference states are gonna be. Cause I can take n x, which we got up above. Actually, I'm gonna comment these out. Cause I'm redefining my reference to be a vector down below. So I, I'm just gonna get rid of this. So I'm gonna take n x times r. This will give me all my reference states. Okay. We could even put u steady state. Why don't we do that? This is what our control input would converge to if um, if we indeed stretch, stretched the spring half a meter. This should converge. I mean, we want this to be 50 newtons. That's what we want to get to. Okay. So I'm just initializing a lot of variables. And then let's make a little for loop. So for k equals two to n. So this is our time step. I'll have my state space model. My states at step k are a times my states. Oh, I should do this because I'm taking all of the elements in column k. Don't I need some initial variables? Great point, Mike. Okay, we'll come back to that. Well, let's let's say the states are starting at rest. Like, let's say, um, so we're redefining the R, X, R, and U steady state here. That's right, Maddie. Yeah, I just the, I'm just redefining it because I'm making R into a vector at this point. The stuff that I was writing up here, I was more just um, just just checking. Yeah, it's just so it's a vector the same length this time. Thank you, Kate. Okay, so B times U, K minus one. I'll just fill in these things first and then we might have to rearrange them, we'll see. C times X, this is your standard output equation. Did I define D as zero up above? I did, okay, good. Now you, here we go. This is something different than what we've done so far in the class. We're gonna have minus K times XK minus our reference states this time. And we're not using an estimator yet. Like usually you don't know the true state so you wouldn't be able to substitute those in here but let's just assume we know them. I think this will work. Oh, you know what? So Mike mentioned initial states. Let's say that our initial position is zero. So that's fine. This already defines the initial position is zero. If this is zero, then the states will be zero. Let's just assume everything's at rest. So those will be zero, but the initial input I think we do have to define that oh wait that'll be zero or wait no 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 it won't because even if our initial states are zero our reference states are not 
zero. They're gonna be 0 0.5 times in X. So, so this is gonna be non-zero. Okay, so this will just run. It'll simulate our controller. This is the control input we're always plugging in. Let's make a figure. First, let's just let's just plot. Let's plot the reference. And I'll make it like a red line. And then I'm also going to on the same plot. I'm going to do the the output. And I'll use black dots for this. And then I'll pump up the marker size so they're really visible. Maybe I'll make it like 14. So I'll make like an X label. This should be time in seconds. And then I'll put a legend on here. This is our, the first thing we're plotting is the reference. And then, and then we're plotting the output. So what are we actually measuring? Maybe I'll be a little more specific. It's a reference position. And this is the, the output position that we actually get. You have T, R, Y. Oh, goodness gracious. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay, let's, let's run this. Let's see if it works. I don't see any obvious errors. Okay. This is the problem that I'm talking about. We want to move to 0.5. And when we run this controller with the difference between the states and the reference states, uh, it moved us in the wrong direction. And we have massive, massive steady state error. Okay. And um, if we were to plot our control input we know it, it should have been 50 newtons to move. Forgot a layer of parentheses in the UK. I think it's good. I think it's good because we have the this parentheses on this side and the other side. No, like this this massive error, it's not an error in our code. Uh, like our, our code is correct, I think. But when you run your controller like this, it's very common to have steady state error. How do we fix this steady state error? Do we need to add, don't we need to add zeros? Wait, what do you mean by, uh, oh, to track it perfectly. You're, you're, you're on the right track, Carl. You're very close. Change the type of system. Yes. Okay, so remember. Remember. Like we add zeros to the governing transfer function. You're very close. You're very close. Remember. Because what does system type mean? Remember system type dictates steady state error properties. So for example, if you want to perfectly, or, or if you have a step reference and you want to converge with zero error to that reference, you need a type one system. Need type one system to track a step reference with no steady state error. Can you hear? That's my wife making a smoothie. <laughs> Can you hear that?
she's really blending it. Really getting the job done. The smoothies she makes are out of this world. Okay, so my there's there's one smoothie with um, peach, oats, maybe some other stuff. I don't know all the details, but that one's really good. And there's also one with spinach, uh, pineapple. You just bought a blender? This summer's about to be healthy. Man, I tell you what, I freaking love smoothies. Okay, 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 okay. We need a type one system. So I'll just finish this little line of reasoning. I know we're running a little bit over. I'll finish this little line of reasoning and then we'll get into how to implement this last time. Spinach and pineapple. It is interesting. I, you, you wouldn't think it's good. It's, oh. Ooh. Tropical fruit plus spinach plus ginger. Yes. If we are in modal coordinates, how do we know that the output Y is position? That's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll, we, we can talk a little more. Let me, let me finish this. Okay, so you need a type one system. What does a type one system mean? It means one open loop pull at Z equals positive one. You've contemplated putting chicken and rice in a blender so it can go down. Don't do that. Stop it. Okay, so my question for you is, what if I want to add an open loop pole to this system? Okay, first, this is the first question. What is an open loop pole for a state space system. That's my first question for you guys. Spinach, pineapple, bananas, raspberry. You guys are making me hungry. Arnold would approve. You're talking about Arnie Schwarzenegger. Okay, focus. What's an open loop pull for a state space system? Is it like <laughs> Adding something in K. Well, I'm not talking about how to add a pole yet. I'm just saying like, what, like how do I even know what my open loop poles are? Okay, here we go. Here's, here's the answer. Eigenvalues of your A matrix. Yes. Yes, Carl, that's, I know you were on the right track But it was poles, not zeros. Yes. So if you take, so let's go back over here. Oops. If we take the eigenvalues of A, um, we have these complex conjugate poles. We don't have a pole at one. So that means that, um, so the homework for today is a type one system. Wait, is it? I don't remember what the transfer function looks like. It could be. So right now we don't have a type one system. Um, okay, so this is the next question. How do I add an eigenvalue 
at z equals positive 1 to the A matrix. Controllable canonical form of A has an eigenvalue of 1. Okay, then it is a type 1 system. And it would perfectly track a step reference just all on its own. And this is the, okay, so this is the cool thing. Uh, so would A og and B og be the A and B matrices with a pole at Z equals one? Yes, Danny. Danny Wilkinson. Yes. So, okay, th this is the last thing we'll do. Um, so here's what you do. You need to add a state to your state space model. <laughs> okay, and this is the interesting state. I mean, this is the interesting thing. This state should be defined as as the discrete integral of the output error. And I guess this is what we'll start with on, on Wednesday. So what is the output error? We're familiar with the output error. The output error is just the We've been calling it E. So E at step K is just the difference between the reference and the output. That's your output error. So we're going to define a new state, which is the discrete integral of the output error. The discrete integral, fortunately, is a very simple thing. It's just the sum of all output errors up to a point. So maybe we'll maybe we'll leave it right there. So we'll we'll start class on Wednesday right here. We're going to we're going to add a state to create an augmented model because when you add a state you're increasing the dimension and now your A matrix is going to be um, uh, bigger because your state vector increased in size. If you wanted to add, like if you want a type two system, you'd have to have more than one integral. Yeah, I mean, you need more than one eigenvalue at positive one. So, it, We'll get into this and, and you'll see this is it's um it will indeed add a pole at z equals one and it'll get rid of our steady state error problems so like to bring this back to our project let's see so you can do this you can do part one of the project you can do this wednesday you can do this Um, yeah, and Wednesday you'll be able to do this as well. probably by Wednesday you'll be able to rock the rest of this project. So really th this, this project is, it, it's not going to be as intense as the first, but that, that's, Part of the reason why it's not as intense is just because of the state space technique. You don't have to do as much heavy lifting to solve for a lot of the control stuff. I mean, there's some weird stuff you have to do with augmenting your states and whatever, but uh, once you do that, it's you'll see it's not it's not too bad. So, okay, we're gonna end there today. We're just rocking this last week of classes. Could you show the code real quick before we go? Mine's not correct. Yeah, sure. 
Oh yeah, and then some people were, there were some questions that I, that I skipped over. Okay, let me show you. We our A, B, C, D, we got our sampling period. We have this to solve for NX and NU. And we're gonna use NX to get our reference states. So I defined the Z star. Based on Z star, we use the Ackermann formula to get the feedback gain. This is just initializing all these variables. This is defining the reference, reference states. This is what I want my steady state control to converge to, but we don't right now. And then we just got this standard for loop where we haven't even worried about estimation yet. Uh, Cause I just wanted to show you, even if you perfectly know the states, this controller is not quite what we need it to be yet because it's not type one. For homework, the given states for part four, would these equate to the Y naught and X naught parts of our code from last week, having trouble visualizing their meaning? Wait, maybe I can, where's this thing? Five. Jimmy Lee, you found it, nice. The given states for part four. Would those equate to the Y naught and X naught parts of our code from last week? Having trouble visualizing their meaning. So, okay, first of all, talking about these states, I've gotten some questions about like, what is the physical meaning of the first state and the second state? Um, I think from the from the given problem, you kind of like with modal coordinates today, um, these states are not in physical coordinates. So it's hard to say like, is this angular velocity, is this position? I mean, it is related to those physical quantities, but each one, each state in itself is not like position or velocity. So it's, so, so that's the first thing. Um, now, if you're looking for the initial output given these states. Like, let's go over here. So if you have like x at time zero is one minus one or something. If you want your initial output, you know, we have the equation yk is cxk plus d uk. So this formula works for the initial time step as well. So given that, you can figure out what the initial output would be. I think the D matrix is zero, so you don't even have to worry about that. Is that what you're asking, Carl? Ashish, I don't know whether or not you're you're thinking about shifting the grad project deadline, but if shifting the deadline by a day or two would overburden you, then please don't do that. You've taken care of us when other professors were grilling us. So we can take this one for you if that helps. Hey, hey, I appreciate it. No, I'll think, I'll think about it. I don't think it's a big deal um, to shift that. I appreciate that sentiment though. Um, Carl says, kinda. Yeah, just think of it. Um, I give you some initial states. Those states are related to what you're measuring by this output equation. So if you want to know like, hey, what is the physical meaning of these states? Like we know that Y is the measured azimuth angle. So it's kind of like where the, where the antenna is pointing. So 
So when you plug these states in here, you're, you're at least going to get the initial angle. So the estimated state x hat first column is minus one, one. Yes. Yes, Carl. You are correct. Somebody else asked something earlier that I skipped over. For question four, part C, is it okay if my overshoot is way over the criteria because our initial state? Well, okay, so overshoot is weird for this problem too. So let me let me explain. Let me explain. Remember when we defined overshoot, like we start here at rest and then we apply a step and then the system does something like this and then we define you know the overshoot based on this it's very important to remember that when we derived this we we used formulas where this was starting at rest so um what i kind of unintentionally did on this homework is i made the initial condition so that there's some like initial velocity so like imagine if i gave a step response to this same system but it was already like moving that way actually i i don't know it would probably come back to it would probably come back down here Would it have the same steady state value? I think it would. But yeah, if you imagine this, like if it started with some velocity, it's gonna have more overshoot. So when you look at the response of your system, you're not really gonna be able to verify that the overshoot criteria is met or even the, the settling time exactly. Um, so that's why some students have been asking me like, okay, do we just skip that part? And I, I don't want to say skip the verification. Like it, it's more instructive to s think about, well, like what I would do is I would give, uh, hmm. It'd be better if there was, if we could find a set of initial conditions where the system is at rest. Is it possible to find the overshoot for this problem? Yes. So you, we have to find, you have to find initial conditions where the system is at rest, but it has a non-zero angle. Because the goal of this controller is to bring the angle back to zero. So like, I definitely want Y zero to be something non zero, but the question is like, what do the initial states have to be such that this is non zero, but Y dot is zero. Wait, maybe you could do that um, by it's not as easy with a discrete time system. Um, I'd have to think about it. I'd have to think, but the key is you have to make initial conditions that satisfy this. And then if you, if you can simulate those initial conditions, 
then you'll actually be able to verify the overshoot and the settling time using the same rules that we've done earlier in the class. What is the overshoot criteria? I'm only seeing damping ratio and settling time mentioned. Well, because uh, overshoot is dependent on damping ratio. Usually when you see a damping ratio performance constraint, it, it really they're talking about overshoot. I replied to your email about meeting. I just wanted to make sure you got it and saw that we're good to go for Thursday. Oh, yes. Perfect. Yeah, I'll send you uh, I'll send you a zoom link. Are there any other questions I skipped? Kind of scrolling here. If we are in modal, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. If we are in modal coordinates, how do we know that the output y is position? So, okay, so modal coordinates. Like, let's say, wait, maybe I should go back here. Okay, so let's start with physical coordinates. Um, X, K, let's assume that this is the physical coordinates. I'm just kind of making this generic. Um, Which way do I want to do this? You could call the modal coordinates, maybe you call them like Z or something. So this, these are states and physical coordinates. Um, Basically, there's a transformation matrix. I don't know, maybe we'll call it like P that relates the modal coordinates to the physical. I'll come back to that in a second. Because we it's important that we have the output equations like Y is C times XK plus D times UK. So let's say in physical coordinates, I know that y is some some physical thing like we're measuring it with the sensor its position um now when i go to modal coordinates or like the same equation here you could say that x is p inverse so like this is a relationship between something in physical and modal coordinates so like what we could do is you could plug this relationship into your original state equation. And what's going to happen when you do that? So let's do it. You're going to have P inverse times Z right here is going to be A times P inverse ZK minus one plus B UK minus one. So if you do this, if you get Z by itself, you have to multiply both sides by the P matrix. So I'd have P A, P minus one, Z K minus one.
this is your A matrix in modal coordinates. Um, but you were talking about the output, like, so what I want to do, you can do the same thing, plug this into your output equation. And remember, I know that the output is, say it's position or something, but when I make this substitution, I'm gonna have Y is C times P inverse ZK plus D UK. This is your C matrix in modal coordinates. And this is the interesting thing. So my Y is something physical that I'm measuring with the sensor. It's positioned. It's related to whatever, let's call these our modal states by a different C matrix. So it's like I have something that's not physical, but I can still find a way to transform it back into physical coordinates. Um, so what you're seeing in the example of above, like you have a kind of a weird C matrix. And the reason it looks like this is because it's the original C matrix multiplied by a transformation matrix. And um, you can find out, so for modal coordinates, this transformation matrix is, um, it's the eigenvectors of your like original A matrix kind of stacked side by side. So my, my only reason for saying that is like, you know what this matrix is too. When you're doing modal coordinates, you you know the transformation matrix. So it's not like P is unknown. I can figure out what that conversion would be. But yeah, you run into stuff like this. Like when you do a system identification of a system, um, like some popular system ID techniques, they're called subspace methods. What they do is you give them some input output data from an experiment and it gives you back some A, B, C, D matrices. But I'm gonna put like a hat on these because it gives these matrices to you in like a totally random coordinate system because the computer's not reasoning through like, hey, what are physical coordinates and this and that? No, it's just like you gave me input and output data. Here's a set of matrices that model that data well. And so you're gonna find yourself in situations working with like, what the heck, do, like the states mean nothing. Um, but even in that situation, like the, the output equation is gonna be something physical because you put sensors on a real life thing so um but it's going to be related to these weird states and you'll just have uh some c matrix that unlocks that relationship for you It's very interesting. <coughs> All right, guys. Wow, we are in the last, the very last week. We're gonna meet on Wednesday. We're gonna talk about more stuff. We'll meet on Friday. We'll see what we have left. And then even next week, I'll be around to answer questions and stuff. So it's not like, it's not like I'll be gone. We have office hours today if you still need help on the homework. All right, see you Wednesday, Antonio.
We meet at 4 p.m. on Discord for office hours. Don't forget it. See you, Pika. See you, Carl. Hey, peace, Brandon. Thank you, Kate. See you guys later. Peace.